Good evening. Welcome, everybody. I'm Jennifer Spurrier. I'm from the Southwest Collection Special Collections Library, located right next door. Welcome to the Texas Tech University Libraries. Dean Gerlich regrets that she couldn't be here this evening, but I'll tell her that we have a good attendance, and I appreciate you all coming out. You didn't come here to listen to me, so I'm about to pass the torch off to Marie Meyer Brunges, who is the president of the Friends of the Library. Thanks very much, Jennifer. And I, too, am going to be very brief. Um, you know, it is really cool to be part of the Texas Tech University Libraries. <clears throat> you know, the thing that struck me last year was the figure that 6,000 students a day come through here. Now I'll grant you they may come to meet somebody, they may come to study, but however they come, they use the libraries. And I think that's amazingly cool. I'm glad uh, that Superintendent Baird and Henry Crawford are here to talk to us. And Jake, would you like to make a little announcement, please? I don't know where exactly you are. Yeah. Jack, I beg your pardon, go for it. I told him he had a second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a long second. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jack. And by the way, it really is a cool book. I've read it, I loved it, and I'm gonna read it again. Okay, the mission of the Friends of the Library, I will even read it to you so I don't get it wrong, is to support the services, collections, facilities, and activities of the libraries, as well as to sponsor activities such as this that promote knowledge of and interest in the university libraries and affiliated ideas. Okay, thank you, welcome all of you, and uh, consider joining. Gretchen, would you like to come and tell us what's coming? Yeah. Well, we have two fabulous speakers tonight. We're so lucky to have them. Um, first and form first, and foremost, <laughs> no, for, first is, you, he's first and, and Donald is foremost. Okay, we've got that straight. This is, I think everybody here probably knows Dr. Henry Crawford. He's the retired history curator for the Museum of Texas Tech. He has an MA in American History and Museum Sciences from University of Wisconsin. He's been a museum professional and an active living history reenactor for over 30 years. He serves on several museum association boards and has consulted on and appeared in various television and video productions. So I'm going to introduce Henry first, and Henry's got some things to tell us about the museum's Sharps Buffalo Rifle. Um, thanks for thanks for letting me come and chat a little bit. I've, I've been told I have about ten minutes to talk about this gun, so if I can talk about this gun for about five hours, there's no problem at all. I still have plenty can y'all hear him? Oh. Okay, I'm sorry. Pardon me. Don't worry about it. I, I, I can do that. Yeah. Anyway, I was just saying that um, I can uh, 
talk about this gun for about five hours, but they gave me 10 minutes. I can do that. <laughs> so just let me know if I'm going over. Um, like uh, Gretchen said, I'm the former curator of history at the Museum of Texas Tech. And what I'm going to talk about is my all-time favorite artifact in the museum collection. And when I retired, I made sure I told Cameron Saffel, who's the current curator of history, that I want visitation rights. <laughs> so, and he agreed to that. He's a great guy. One of my former students, actually. But um, anyway, what I have here is a very special artifact. It's a very special Sharps rifle. Since we're talking about buffalo and buffalo hunting, and it's one of my areas of research, uh, as well as reenacting, and I do have a Sharps at home. Um, this, one, this particular one is very, very important for three primary reasons. One reason is that it belonged to a famous man. It belonged to John Wesley Moore. Um, he and his brother, J. Wright Moore, this is John Wesley right here, um, are credited with starting the buffalo hunting craze that begins in Kansas in the early 1870s, and from Dot centering on Dodge City. They moved to Texas in the mid-70s, and then from there, buffalo hunting moves on to Montana, where it finishes off about 1883. So that's one reason. Another reason is we have good documentation on where it came from. We know exactly when it was ordered. We know exactly when it was shipped, and we know when it was, when it was delivered. This is a document from the Sharps Rifle Archives. Uh, this is, uh, the archives is a, in a private collection owned by Dr. Richard Lebowski. And uh, when I was doing research on this, I contacted Dick, he's a friend of mine. And I said, hey, what can you tell me? What can you send me about this rifle? That's what you do. You, if you have the serial number of a gun and you wanna get more information about it, you contact the archive that happens to have it and uh, you give them the serial number and they can pull up records and tell you all kinds of things about it. We've done the same thing with our Winchester guns at the museum collection too, as well as mine. Um, but anyway, Dick sent me a really nice document. It's on Sharps Rifle uh, Company uh, stationery and basically what it says, it confirms the serial number, it tells us what type of rifle it was, it tells us who, when it was ordered, it tells us um, it was, it, who it was consigned to. It was consigned to T.E. Jackson at Fort Griffin and, uh, and delivered in January. It left the factory in, on January 12th, 1877. And uh, I'm, I'm based on what I understand about shipping in the 1870s, it probably got to Fort Griffin probably toward the end of January, first part of February. Uh, we know that this was one of two rifles that were ordered that day. We just happened to have the order letter right here that was uh, sent off from Fort Griffin, from T.E. Jackson, signed by T.E. Jackson. Uh, and this uh, documents what else came into that order. Um, and what I've done is uh, I've transcribed that order letter. Basically, this is what it looks like and this is what it reads. Um, the third reason why this is really important is because we know where it's been almost every day of its life. It was donated to us by uh, John Wesley Moore's daughter in, 18, in 1955. So it came straight from the family to here. We know this gun was used on the Buffalo Range here in Texas. Uh, we know it shot Buffalo. Um, one of the neat things that came in with that collection, which is a huge, huge collection, uh, when I was curator, I, I never had a chance to fully go through and look at everything. Um, but some of the things that came in with that collection were some other tools, uh, including, I'll show you this photograph here, I'm sorry, this is too small. Um, that's that artifact on top is called a butcher steel, it's for sharpening skinning knives, and the artifact at the bottom is a corkscrew. Yes, they did drink in buffalo camps. Um, in fact, some of the uh, uh, ledgers and some of the inventory, uh, inventory lists will show you that they not only had beer and whiskey, just like the movies say, but they also had claret and champagne. They enjoyed sangria. They enjoyed all of these fine things, even canned oysters. So you ate well in a buffalo hunter. You didn't smell good, but you ate well. Um, anyway, let's talk a little bit about Jackson. If you ever go up to Fort Griffin, 
Um, on the road, just before you go up the hill to the fort, you continue on the road about 200 yards, and off to the, off to the right, you'll see this building down the road. That was T.E. Jackson's home. It's now owned by Fort Griffin. Uh, the Fort Griffin superintendent just was, was living in the house. Now they're, they're, they've moved to another house, and they're converting it. They're going to make it into a visiting center. So that was T.E. Jackson's home. If you're ever going down uh, through Albany and go by the courthouse, on the left, you'll see this building. That was T.E. Jackson's warehouse right there in town. Okay. Now, a little bit more about Jackson. One of the other things that makes this gun interesting and unique is that Jackson didn't really sell that many Sharps rifles. And part of the reason is that his business partner uh, did some uh, creative accounting and ran off with a, m most of the funds for the company. His business partner's name was, T was uh, J Julius Wallach. This is a copy of, Julius, of uh, Jackson and, and Wallach's uh, business card. And uh, what happened was he embezzled funds that forced Jackson temporarily out of business. Uh, he did go after him. He did sue. They found him. They, 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 uh, he was prosecuted and all those things. Uh, but anyway, that sort of put him out of business as far as um, selling guns out of, out of uh, Fort Griffin. However, they did maintain that uh, branch, that, that store in um, Albany. So right now... As far as Sharps rifle historians know, there are probably less than a dozen documented Sharps rifles that were sold by Jackson at Fort Griffin, and this is one of them. So, yeah, wow. When I came across all of that, that's why I said, wow. Um, I came across a lot of this documentation when I was still the registrar at the museum. It was, happened to be in some of the uh, correspondence files. And I looked at it and I said, huh, that's different. <laughs> and through subsequent research and looking at the gun and, and, um, and checking things out, I found a lot of inf interesting things about this rifle. And uh, my big interest in uh, Texas buffalo hunting as well as buffalo hunting in other places. So that's basically the story that I have. And that, there's your 10 minutes, folks. Um, if you have any other questions about this rifle or about Texas buffalo hunting, you can do one of two things. You can catch me at the end of the program, or you can have me come in and talk for two hours about Texas buffalo hunting. <laughs> I prefer both. <laughs> okay. All right. And I want to um, thank Cameron Saffel here. Cameron is our current curator of history. He's the guy who brought the rifle in for me to play with. This is like visiting with an old buddy. Cabinet five. <laughs> so, so anyway. Um, Thank Cameron when you get a chance to talk to him. One other thing, if everybody, if anybody wants to uh, visit, uh, there's another site that I'd like to talk about, think, talking about Buffalo. The, Cap, the Comanchero Canyons Museum in Kittaquay just opened not long ago, a couple of years, year or so. Um, they, do, they deal with the history of the Comancheros, um, which operated up and down the canyon lands uh, along, the, along the Cap Rock. Uh, the Comancheros were the Me New Mexican traders who uh, traded had a heavy, heavy trade with the Comanche Indians, um, and they were, it's a very, very important story, uh, Texas story. So um, up in Kittaquay, Comanchero Canyons Museum. I only have a couple of brochures, but uh, if you're really interested in going to visit that, please do. So. Is this the gun that killed the white buffalo? No, it is not. Uh, we don't know which gun killed the white buffalo. Uh, there is one at Frontier, Texas, in the museum there that belonged to Jay Wright Moore, who was John Wesley Moore's brother, um, but we don't know if that's the one that did it. There's another gun that's in the family, that's still in the family, that may have been the one that did it. We don't know. Um, a friend of mine down there took me to the site where the white buffalo was killed, and it's a pretty interesting place. So. Thank you, Henry. Always interesting. Henry's always interesting. Well, our guest speaker is uh, Donald Baird, and he is the superintendent of the Caprock Canyon State Park, where the Texas State Buffalo Herd is housed and where it's been rehabilitated and re-socialized and whatever else. Uh, Donald graduated with a bachelor's degree in wildlife management from Tarleton State in Stephenville. He's worked for Texas Parks and Wildlife since 2006. 
prior to his career in the department, he worked on private ranches in North Texas as both a ranch hand and wildlife manager. In addition, he's worked in the private security industry and has owned and, and been a business owner for several years. Donald took over management of Cap Rock Canyon State Park in 2009. The Texas State Buffalo Herd was transferred from the Wildlife Division to the State Park in 2010. Leadership within the department signed on to the restoration plan immediately, and from that point on, the design, development, implement, and implementation of restoring these indi indigenous animals to their native habitat has been one of the main focuses of the park staff when not talking about the Texas State Buffalo Herd and Caprock Canyon State Park, Donald volunteers his time with other organizations to promote mutual benefits of economics and conservation of the magnificent North American bison worldwide. He currently serves as vice president of the Texas Bison Association um, and chairman of the Conservation Committee for the National Bison Association, as well as being a member of a bison specialist group for the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Uh, his wife owns a business in nearby Kittaquay, and they have, how many children do you have? Three. Three. I didn't get that down. He has three children. And so um, we are, he's a wonderful speaker. This is an unbelievably fabulous and important project. And so please help me to welcome Donald Beard. Thank you, Gretchen. Can y'all hear me okay, everybody? I'm uh, in a library, so I'm not used to talking loud inside a library, so this is gonna be kind of fun. I get to talk loud. Nobody's gonna get on to me, right? Well, that was awesome, Gretchen. You just gave my whole slideshow. We can go home now. <laughs> no, it was great. So thank y'all for having me here. This is an awesome opportunity. Um, uh, first thing I wanna ask is show of hands, who's been to Caprock? It's quite a few, quite a few, quite a few haven't too. I see you over there. So you guys need to make sure you come visit us. Uh, it's only an hour, 15, hour, 20 minutes away from here. It's not very far. It's a good day trip. You can come out, spend a few hours, drive around, see the herd. It's a pretty neat experience. Uh, so anyway, let's get started. Again, my name is Donald Beard. I'm the park superintendent at Caprock Canyon State Park. And let me turn this on. And we're ready to go. So we're going to talk about these guys right here. Let me adjust this a little bit here. We're talking about the North American bison. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have a pop quiz. So anybody want to guess how much they can weigh? Wow. You guys got it right off the bat there, huh? 2,000 pounds. That's perfect. It's a ton. That's a lot of animal. These guys are the largest mammal, well, largest mammal in North America, um, and they run fast. Anybody want to guess how fast they can run? Close. She says 45. Anybody else? We're going the wrong way. A little higher in between 30. Yeah, yeah. A little more, a little more, a little more. How about 40? <coughs> but everybody was right in that ballpark, so we're good. We're good. So, yeah, these guys can run 40 miles an hour. That's faster than a horse. These guys can outpace a horse. That's why you don't work bison on the back of a horse very often because uh, you can and you can train them, but every now and then one of these big old bulls will get mad and decide he's had enough and turn around and chase you back. You know, that does happen. So speaking of the bulls, this is a bull. Like I said, they'll weigh 2,000 pounds. The cows don't weigh near that much. They're probably 1,000 pounds or so. And uh, because our animals are on the southern plains, as most of you probably know, the, the further south you get, the smaller you get in body size. So our guys, we don't have any bulls that weigh 2,000. 1,800, you know, 1,900, that's about as big as our guys will get. But that's still plenty big, plenty fast. Just want to make sure I heard it. Every time I do this presentation, I hear that. Okay, so yes, that is a baby. Now, these guys are born, and just within minutes, uh, we actually caught one on video couple of years back of being born. It's the first one I've had the video, had a chance of video, and just within minutes of being, a, being born, that thing was up and wobbling around. It was wobbly, but it could stand just in a few minutes. And it just not very long after that, it's able to walk around. First thing it does, go find mama, get a drink. And the next thing you know, it's running around. Just in a couple hours, it's running around. Now, why do you think that, that this animal would, would be able to be mobile so fast? 
predators for one reason, yes, absolutely. But the main reason is they're migratory. So the herd is always on the move. Okay, so those, those babies have to keep up with the herd so they don't get attacked by predators. So yeah, these guys are born in a prairie, so it's wide open spaces. You know, they're, they're, the herd is moving, so they've got to get up and move real fast. <clears throat> so now I've got a question. Are we talking about buffalo or are we talking about bison? <laughs> Henry's answer is actually pretty correct there. Technically, there are no buffalo in North America, technically. Everything that we have is North American bison. That being said, since the days of, of the buffalo hunters and beyond, they were been called buffalo, and that name is kind of stuck. So if I'm sitting in a room full of bison uh, specialists, ge uh, uh, geneticists or something like that, I'm probably going to call them bison. But you're going to hear me say bison. You're going to hear me say buffalo. It doesn't matter. It's, it's a synonym that means the same thing. But technically, these are bison. If you're talking about buffalo, you're talking about the African Cape buffalo or the Asian water buffalo. That's where the name buffalo came from. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, historic numbers. Estimated historical numbers were somewhere between 30 to 60 million bison. That's a lot of animals. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a little cough, so if I cough a little bit that's what it is so 30 to 60 million bison roamed the plains in north america that stretched all the way from canada down to mexico i want you to remember that number because it's it's pretty important it'll come up a couple of times 30 to 60 million now that's a that's a lot of numbers that's a, that's a lot of zero so what i've done is i've i've done a lot of research and i pulled out a couple of quotes that really kind of give you an idea how many animals that could have been i'm gonna read a couple of these quotes to you <coughs> From the, from the top of the ridge, they could see 15 miles or more in the distance. The view reminded them of the ocean where water and skies seemed to join. From their vantage point, they saw buffalo, more than either man had ever seen. As far as they could see, there were buffalo scattered in herds of various sizes. So I've read accounts of bison stretching for far as you can, you know, we're in the plains, so you can see a long ways, right? So as far as you can see that way, as far as you can see that way, and as far as you can see that way, nothing but bison. Ten miles wide, hundred miles long, herd of bison. A lot of animals. So this next quote is probably one of my favorites. I love this quote. An old buffalo hunter remembered a time he was camped on the banks of the Beaver Creek in western Kansas. He said the stream was six feet wide and about six inches deep with swiftly running water. A buffalo herd came to the creek above our camp and drank it dry. For hours the creek bed was dry until the great herd passed on. That's a lot of water. Thank you very much. Is that water? <laughs> so anyway, that's a, that's a lot of water that would be coming down that creek. And these guys were camped downstream. All of a sudden, the water stopped running. You look up, and there's these bison. And they're not sitting there drinking. They're crossing. But as they cross, they get a drink. So it's one after another, after another, after another. And they just constantly drink so much water that the creek just stopped drying. Sorry, stopped, stopped running. So if you're around in the 1500s, you might see a, a, a site like this on the plains. So you've got some Native Americans, and they're hunting bison. If you look at them closely, they're wearing uh, wolf skins. They've got bow and arrows, so a sharp pointy stick, and they're pretty much barefoot. Those are some tough hombres to be able to hunt bison like that. But they did. They had to because that was their supply. That was their Walmart. Everything they got, they got from the bison. Food, shelter, uh, clothing, tools, it all came from the bison. And they were pretty good at it, but when, they, when the horses came back, they, they became even better at it. So they would start hunting and be able to kill more and feed their, their culture. Even uh, from Mexico, ciboleros would come up and hunt bison. So what I'm telling you basically is, is that people have been hunting bison in North America for a long, long time. Matter of fact, in Caprock Canyons, we have a bison kill site that has been dated back over 10,000 years. So people have been hunting bison in these neck of the woods for over 10,000 years and beyond. So it wasn't until these guys came along that we started seeing a, an issue. These guys being the commercial hunters, you know, like, like Henry. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, the, these guys came in and, and started the, the hunt for the hides. 
Um, does anybody other than Henry know what what happened to these hides, where they went to? Absolutely. Maybe I should ex maybe I should exclude you too. Now. So so what what it is is most of these be uh, hides. At the same time this was going on the hunt, the, there was a, something going on back east called the Industrial Revolution, and they had all these big machines, and they needed belting. They figured out that bison leather made really good belts for these machines. So most of these hides ended up as uh, belts for the Industrial Revolution. So I put together some numbers just to kind of show how this kind of transpired, and this is just a brief moment in time. So it's actually uh, the destruction of the southern herd, from 1872 to 1874, about 3.1 million were killed in the Dodge City and surrounding area. So 3.1 million bison in a three-year period. Oops, I skipped a little bit. So that same time period, about 400,000 were killed for Native Americans for the high trade. So even the Native Americans, some of the Native American cultures got into the high trade as well. Uh, and, and one year alone, more than 20,000 were killed here, right here in this area in the Panhandle. And I've heard numbers way more than that, but you know that's just a number that I can find real easy. So um, another 150 were killed by settlers between here and Dodge City in one year. The total slaughter in about three years was about 3.7 million bison. That's a lot of animals. And how many did we start with? 30 to 60 million bison. Three years we killed you know, 5 to 10 percent of them. That's quite a few of them right there. Yes, sir. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll get to a little bit of that here in a second. Absolutely. <laughs> so, this is a buffalo hunters camp about eighteen mid eighteen seventies. Um, there's a couple of cool things to point out in this thing. So you look and and this this is a hide that they've got staked out to dry. So this guy here, he's got a. Uh, rack of something he's fixing to put up here. That was my next quiz, Henry. <laughs> Those are bison tongues, in case anybody didn't hear that. That's what they, they uh, cherished the most out of the meat was the tongue. They would pickle it or salt it or, and turn it into a delicacy. So you got a spinning wheel back here to sharpen his knives. And this, you got this guy back here and this guy over here. And I'm sure it was hot. It was probably summertime. And you know, and some of this stuff didn't wasn't prepared very well, and some of it rotted, and you know, and these guys probably hadn't had a bath in a few months. So, yeah, you can kind of imagine what that camp's going to smell like, right? They say you could smell these camps from miles away. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they may have ate well, like Henry said, but they didn't smell well. So this is a typical scene of what you'd see. Uh, they're skinning this cow. I bet that dog had plenty to eat. Lots of scraps. And then you would see this when they were done. This was littered all over the prairies, all over the plains. Just everywhere you look, just dots after dots of dots of, of bison. Yeah, if you look at this real close, this is just a skull. These are skulls. There's no other part of the animal other than the skulls. So every one of these represents one animal. That's a lot. 40,000 hides getting ready to ship out of Dodge City, Kansas. 40,000. That's just one shipment. Even the railroads got into it. So the railroad cut right through the middle of the plains, right? And the herds would stop the trains. They would migrate through, and the trains would have to stop and wait on them. And they'd it would cost them money because they'd be delayed. So they finally decided, you know what, let's just get into this and we'll take people out there for hunting excursions. And I wouldn't call it hunting, it was shooting. It was always just shooting excursions. Some of them wouldn't even get off the train, they would just shoot out the windows. And this, this wasn't for the hide trade, it wasn't for anything other than just shooting. That's all it was. This is a great map. This is out of uh, William Temple Hornaday's book. This shows the the historic range of bison, it's a pretty big range, way up here in Canada, down here in Mexico, pretty much everything except for the coasts. 
Now, I know you can't read this, but these are numbers or dates. So what you see is, is this, this one may say 1820-something, and then you get in here as the 1830s and 50s. And so as you get nearer to present time, the range shrinks, and you get these blue that one there and that one there. It's a blue one. So that was the beginning of the different herds. It's the same species of animal, but you would have a northern herd and you would have a southern herd. Anybody know why they split like that? It wasn't the mountains. It was the railroad. That's about where the railroad went through right there. It wasn't that the bison wouldn't cross the track, because they would but they were harassed so much it just caused a split. And during the migration, you would have some from here that would migrate up to here and some from here that would migrate down to here. It wasn't a clean line. I mean, there was, it was a messy line. But it basically started the southern herd and the northern herd of bison. So finally, you got to a point about 1895, there was only four, 541 animals left. So we started how many? 30 to 60 million 1895, we're at 541. That's crazy, isn't it? That's about as close to as extinct as you can go without getting there. That's when these folks stepped in, Charles and Marianne Goodnight. Everybody in, in the panhandle knows who they are, but when I go, I give this presentation all over the state. Actually, I've given it outside the state, too. You know, I have to tell people about these folks, but I think everybody around here understands who they are. And so the story goes that uh, in 1878, Marianne heard the rifles ringing during the day of the, the bison being shot. And at nighttime, you would hear the calves crying. Because if you think about this, that little calf wasn't worth a hide. The bullet cost more than what it would have cost. So they just left the calves, let them starve. So they would be crying during the nighttime, looking for their 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 supper and so Mary Ann heard this and she you know nudged Charles and said hey Charles we've got to do something about this we got to save these animals if we don't they're going to go extinct so Mr. Goodnight either really had a great vision and of a conservationist or he simply just got tired of hearing his wife grab about it we don't don't really know <laughs> anyway he went out and captured a few calves his cowboys you know they brought in a couple of calves over time and that started the herd. That started the, the good night herd in 1878. Somewhere between five and seven animals is what it started with. This is a great picture. This is uh, Old Sykes is the name of this bull. Now, I don't know for sure, but I, I'd be willing to bet that that bull is not among the living anymore in this picture. Yeah. So, so... Okay, so 1878, he started these animals, started this herd, the Goodnight Herd. It's one of the five foundation herds. Let me back this up to this map. Okay, I kind of got out of order. But if you look and you see, you got this blue line, and then it keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking until finally you have these little dots, okay? Just these little dots here and there. And basically what you have there are the five foundation herds, that 541 animals. They were in these little bitty pockets, and every bison alive today came out of one of those five foundation herds. The Goodnight Herd is one of those five. That would have been this one right in this area here. It's one of the five foundations, and as far as I can tell, as far as anybody else can tell, it's the only one of those five foundation herds that's from the Southern Plains, and it's the only one out of all of them that's still in existence as a herd today. So they're, they're pretty unique. They're pretty unique animals, without a doubt. So in the mid-90s, okay, so, so Goodnight had these animals. He died in 1929, and his adopted son, or I don't know if he's legally adopted, but basically what he called his adopted son was his ranch manager, and he kept the ranch after his death, and he managed it, and these bison would escape every now and then, go run off back down into the Paladero Canyon, and then he would go get them, bring them back up. Finally, he got to a point where he was old enough where he went out one time, and he's just gone for several days, and his wife had just about given up on him. And sure enough, over the top of the hill, here come the bison, and he's riding right behind him. She told him that's the last time. You're not doing that anymore. 
So, and that's pretty much what happened. And then the next time they escaped, they went back down into the J.A. ranch where he found the herd from. And uh, they were basically left alone. Sometime in the 1930s, we don't know exactly, it's kind of a gray area. But sometime in that area, they were escaped off into that ranch and were left alone. And they just have been as a wild herd until the mid-90s when the uh, owners of the, the J.A. ranch, still descendants of John Adair, uh, they got a hold of the state and said, we have these animals, we think they're important, we think you need to come look at them, we want to donate them to the state. All right, so, and that's what we did. We sent some biologists down there and looked at them, and they tranquilized one and took some blood samples, and sure enough, they found some genetics that are unique to this herd. They're not found in any other bison in the world. So after doing the, the historical search and the study, it, it like I said, it, it came to be that this is the last of the true Southern Plains bison. We have some really cool animals here. They were, they were captured in the canyons. They lived in the canyons their whole life. They've never been taken out of the canyons. Goodnight sold a lot of animals, but he never brought any in. You know, he did one or two experiments and decided it wasn't good, but for the most part, he never brought any outside animals in. So it's been kept as a closed herd, a Texas herd, a uh, Caprock escarpment herd, basically, forever. So when we captured them, we brought them to the park. That's what we have the descendants of the original good night animals. It's a pretty awesome deal. So we found out that they were uh, pretty important. We decided we were going to bring them back to the park. So we had to go find them. And that's a big ranch. We, when we did find them, we'd get up to them, and he's not killing them. He's shooting them with a tranquilizer gun. They would tranquilize them, load them into these pens, and then drive them over to Caprock Canyon State Park, and that's where they've been ever since. So it started, we brought 32 animals over, is what we trapped out of the wild in 1996, 97. This is uh, our geneticist. He's, uh, he's from Texas A&M. He does all of our genetic work. He is one of the most renowned bison geneticists in the world. I mean, he has tested more bison than anybody else. And, he, uh, he's done all of the research on our animals. and He does all of the Yellowstone work. He does all of Ted Turner's work. I mean, he just, he's all bison. This is some of his work here. You guys understand that? Yeah. You know, it reminds me, because you got different colors. I don't even know if you can see the colors back here, but you got orange and blue and green and red. Do you, everybody ever, ever, anybody ever play pixie sticks, pickup sticks? Remember those pickup sticks? It's kind of what it reminds me of here. So let me explain this, and there's no way you can read it. I can't even read it, but I'll, I'll tell you what it represents anyway. So these animals up here, and these all represent animals, okay? If it's a square, it's a bull. If it's an oval shape, it's a cow. So these dark ones up here, they actually have numbers, but you can't read them. These represent the animals that were captured in the wild on the J.A. Ranch in the mid-'90s, okay? So from day one... Every animal that has come into the herd, that has been born into the herd, we take DNA samples for. We have their complete genetic workup. This is a complete lineage of every animal that's been in the herd. Now, this is, this is old. This is probably six or seven years old. It needs to be updated, but it still tells you what it is. So just to kind of give you an idea, we'll look at this bull right here. He had this cow as a calf, and if you trace it back, this was its mama. So this bull and this cow had this calf together. And you just trace it on down the line, you can see the lineage of who did what to who and when. It's pretty interesting stuff, really. <laughs> oh, number 50, yeah, 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 yeah. Number 50, number 68, there was a few, yeah, 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 we had a few of them. So... Here's the deal. Here's what happens, and, and part of that is, is, a reason, is a reason for this. So we started with 32 animals, what we started with, right? So when we got those animals, they were old animals. They had been living on a JA. They had been harassed and shot, and, you know, the cowboys would go out and rope them, and, you know, and they, they weren't really uh, producing any new animals, so they were aged. So when we brought them over, our goal, obviously, is trying to increase the, the herd size, but we were having issues because they were old. They weren't having a lot of calves. 
a matter of fact, Dr. Durr and some of his associates did a research study and said that we don't do something in about 50 years, their herd is going to die off. They're not going to make it the way they are. We have to do something. Well, so we got this right here. We got this unique genetics not found in any other bison in the world that we want to protect, right? We got that in one hand. In this hand, if we don't do anything, we just protect these genetics and don't do anything, they're going to die. So we had to figure out what we are going to do. So we did a search. Like I said, Goodnight sold a lot of animals. We searched and searched. Of course, this is before me. I say we. It was the agency. Searched and searched. Could not find any animals that still had enough of the Goodnight blood in them because they would just get sold and, and, and put into another herd and, and all that was diluted out. So in 1903, when Goodnight was still alive, uh, there was a big push to save bison across the, the country. And uh, the biggest place that they were trying to save them was in Yellowstone National Park. And in 1903, there were only about 20 bison left in all of Yellowstone. They had been decimated. Even though it was a park for a couple of decades, there was no protection. So poachers just went in and still had their way with animals. And they were down to about 20 animals, and that's all that was left. So the, the National Park Service made an agreement with Charles Goodnight, and he shipped three bulls to Yellowstone. So our genetics are prevalent in the Yellowstone animals. We help save the Yellowstone animals, us and a few others. So, I mean, we can't let, take all the credit, but we like to. <coughs> so anyway, Yellowstone is the last foothold of brucellosis. The greater Yellowstone area is the last place in North America where brucellosis exists. And brucellosis is a disease that causes abortions in cattle, and uh, the cattle, domestic cattle are very susceptible to it. It, it doesn't really affect the bison, but they can transmit it to the cattle, although it's never been scientifically proven that they ever have. But it's still a risk. Most of the brucellosis is trans, transmitted by the wild elk population. But since it's a, a quarantine area, we could not bring any bison out of that area. So that was a you know, nice try, but no, no can do. But here we go. We found this, this herd that came out of Yellowstone in the mid-1930s prior to the brucellosis outbreak, outbreak, and they were shipped to New Mexico. And lo and behold, they were still there, and they had been left alone. And this big, huge ranch, about 600,000-acre ranch, it was owned by the Pennzoil family. They had them shipped out there, and they were mountain bison, and they were just left alone. So from the mid-30s till 19, or about 2000 or so, they had never put any other animals in them. So their genetics were really similar to what were, were came out of Yellowstone, which were at that time were fairly similar to what we had. So, and it just so happened that that our geneticist was doing work for them because Ted Turner recently bought this ranch, so he now owned it. <clears throat> so uh, they did some genetic t testing, and sure enough, there were similar genetics, not the same but similar. We decided we'd try uh, an experiment and see if we could bring some in. Mr. Turner donated a couple of bulls. We brought them back to the park. And that's these guys right here, these three animals right here. Something happened to this one. I never have quite heard the story, but he didn't, he didn't live very long. But these two were breeders for a couple of years. Now, up until about, I don't know, somewhere in this area right here, what you, would, what you had at the park was two paddocks, 150-acre paddocks each. You had the, bison, the, the cows on one side and the bulls on the other side. And during the breeding season... You would, you would have a couple of bulls that would be put in with the cows, and those were the breeders. And that's why you had this right here, because those were the only ones that were allowed to breed. Okay? So that's what they did with these guys here. <coughs> but if you'll see that they had a lot of calves, but in a very short period. These guys were over time. But these guys had calves, like, right here, and that was it. So they were the breeders for a couple of years, and then they took those bulls out of the herd because they didn't want to dilute it too much. They wanted to infuse some new genetics without diluting it. So we put them in there, let them have a lot of calves, and took them back out. And then uh, 10 years later, we did a, another study, and it shows that it actually worked. It worked really well. So our genetic uh, diversity has gone way up. The herd is thriving. We're starting to see a lot of calves. Uh, matter of fact, this year we were expecting 45 new calves. Yeah, so the herd is doing awesome, doing really well. And that's one of the reasons why. We'll get into another reason why here in a second. <coughs> so 
when I first came to the park in 2009, 2010, if, if you went and visited the park, this is the best that you could hope for right here. If you wanted to go see bison at Cap Rock, that's the best you could hope for. Now, to me, that doesn't look like a bison. It looks like a furry cow with earrings. <laughs> yeah, green earrings. And we had some with orange earrings, too, but yeah. So, and, and they had to be that. I'm not talking bad about my predecessors. They had a lot of scientific studies that had to be done on them. So they kept them back there in the paddock. They kept them separated. They, they really concentrated on the breeding program. So this was all necessary. This had to happen. But about the time I got there is when things started to change a little bit. And uh, we saw a uh, change in the, the management of the herd. It came over to state parks. Uh, the, the bison were doing a lot better. They were starting to breed. Things were looking good. So we started working on plan B or, or phase two of the bison project. And that was getting them out where people can see them. So I started at, at, at Cap Rock in 2009. And the divisional director called me before I even went to the park, before I even ever showed up for my first day of job. He called me up, and he was a former chief ranger for national uh, for Yellowstone, so he knew a lot about bison, and uh, he he had a soft spot for these bison. He said, "Donald, we got to do something about those bison. We just can't let them back there. We need them out where people can see them. That's a travesty. Those beautiful animals. They need to be out where people can see them." So okay, well that's my job. I'll do it. You know, so that's what we did. We embarked on that project. Uh, took a while. Took a lot of uh, figuring out how we were going to make things work, but. Uh, about a year after that, we started working on getting them out into the public where we could see them. Now, the park is huge, and there's no way we could do it all at once. It'd take off, you know, you've heard the old saying, bite one bite of that elephant at a time. That's what we've been doing. So in 2011, we had phase one of that project ready to go. And this was the, on the left here is the old paddock where they were kept. And this is James, our lead ranger, and he's getting ready to start cutting a fence to let them out. So to me, these are pretty historic photographs, in my mind anyway. So you can see the bison back there in the background, right? So what we did is we cut the fence, and we made a new gate, and we got ready to shut them out, or turn them out. So September of 2011, we're ready. All right, so we're ready to turn them out. It's a huge deal, right? We're turning bison out into the park, okay? These bison, most of them had grown up there. Most of them had been born inside that, that fence. They didn't know anything about lakes or people or any of this stuff. So I'm thinking, you know, I did my research. I did everything I could do. We tried to figure out what type of fencing works best. How do we do this? How do we do that? But it's still, that's all on paper. You know, when we turn them out, what's going to happen? Are they going to run right through that cattle guard and just keep on going, run all the way to town? I didn't, I didn't know, you know. The lake is a perfect example. They had all of their water were in galvanized tubs. Now they've got a lake. What are they going to do? Are they going to walk off stuck in the mud? Are they going to drown? I mean, I didn't know. There was, there was several sleepless nights up in this. But it's a big deal. So we've got, you know, people from the executives from Texas Parks and Wildlife. We got, we got elected officials. We got uh, county officials, gov city officials. We've got some... A lot of people showing up this morning. We're going to make a big deal out of it, right? Wyman Menzer, everybody know who Wyman is? He was out there. We had another videographer that was doing video. So we had, had you know, documenting it. We were getting all this documentation that we are going to be doing. So we let them out. They came out. Oop. There's Wyman right there. There's our videographer. They came out of this new gate. They looked around. And then they ran back in. <laughs> I got on the radio and said, oh, hope y'all got some pictures. We're done. <laughs> but we were able to coax them back out. And they did come back out. And they started walking around. Then they found the tall grass. And they started liking it. And they said, you know what? This is pretty good. They started exploring around. Went down the lake. It's like they'd been doing it their whole lives. It's just ingrained in them. You know? and, and I knew that. But still, it's, it, it kept me up in that. You know? They even had a couple of them go swimming right then. You know, just dive off in there. This was the first day they were let out. And this is still their favorite corner of the lake. They still go there. That's the spot that they go to. And it's also a pretty good fishing spot. So we have people fishing there quite a bit. And so you can't see, but there's a big hill back here. So you can get down there at the lake, and you're fishing. You can see the lake, but you look behind you, and you don't see anything but a ridge <clears throat> until you get about 50 bison to top it. 
and start coming right towards you. It's kind of fun because you can see them far off. And I can see what's about to happen, so I'll stop and watch. I'll see these guys gathering up all their fishing gear, trying to get out of there real fast. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I'm, I'm kind of mean that way. <clears throat> so anyway, this is the way you see bison now. You see them out along the roadside, you know, where they're supposed to be. So one of my biggest fears were vehicles. All right, so when they were kept in that paddock, uh, there wasn't much to graze. There were too many animals. So everything was fed to them. We fed them a special cube that we had designed, and we fed it out of the back of a, a feeder. This feeder was mounted on a trailer. It's a white feeder on a trailer. White trailers coming into state parks constantly. RVs. So I'm thinking, okay, are these guys going to think every RV that comes into the park is a feed wagon? They're just going to run around rag until they fall over dead. You know, I mean, that was a concern. It really was. But even more so, another concern were motorcycles. They'd never seen a motorcycle before or heard one. I mean, that's like a big old grizzly bear or something, you know. I didn't know how they were going to act. So we shut the park down. After we let them out, we shut the park down for a few days just to kind of let them acclimate a little bit, get used to their surroundings. And I go to open up the park. Lo and behold, guess who our first visitor is? A motorcycle. All right, so we're going to find out. Yeah, we're going to trial, trial by fire here. So I stopped the guy. I took this picture. I'm standing back here taking this picture. And I stopped him about where I am in the photograph, turned his motor off, started talking to him, told him he's going to be our guinea pig. We're going to figure out, you know, your insurance good, you know. <laughs> Come to find out, this guy, and I, I grew up in Fort Worth, so, you know, four and a half hours away. This guy went to the same high school I went to. I didn't know him. He's older than I was, but he went to the same high school, so we kind of chuckled about that. But what's even more ironic is the high school we went to. We went to Haltom High School. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Haltom High School, but guess what our mascot is? The buffalo. How ironic is that, right? So anyway, I told him, I said, just ease on through there. Let's see what happens if they charge you. But they didn't. <laughs> they could care less. It didn't bother them a bit. You know, they just kept on, and nothing has bothered them. They have They've been absolutely perfect. You know, I couldn't ask for the bison to handle themselves any better. They don't mess with the vehicles. They do turn on water spigots. That's the one thing they do. We're constantly having to turn off water spigots because they turn them on. They haven't figured out to turn them off yet. They just turn them on. You know, I guess they get to licking it and it turns it on, you know, getting the water out of it. But, you know, it's, it's kind of bad when they turn it off 5 o'clock in the afternoon. We don't find it till 3 o'clock the next day. It's a lot of water. <clears throat> but anyway, they handle themselves great. They don't pay any attention to vehicles. They don't mess with the people. Um, I can't say the same for people. They haven't been so good. We have not had any serious incident at the park. The bison have always done their side of the deal and turned around and walked away. But I do find people that, even though they've got a lens this long, think they've got to get 10 feet away from it to take a picture. Or, you know, try and get mad because it's standing in the road I mean, seriously, they're mad because of a, they're in a bison jam, you know. And they want, they want the bison to get out of their way so they can go, I don't know where they're going, they're in the state park, you know. I don't understand it. But people do that, and uh, the bison have taken care of business. Thankfully, nobody's been hurt. There you go, there's a bison jam right there. So now you've got to wait for them to cross the road. Yeah, we don't have traffic jams, we have bison jams. You've got to wait for them to cross the road. They love to hang around by the, the headquarters. It's one of their favorite spots. That's where they were this morning, actually. There they are on the, the their corner of the lake again. That kind of shows you a little bit of the hill back here. And they just top that hill up here at the top. And and sometimes they just come right on down. But a lot of times they'll stop. And then it's kind of like a, a Western movie where you see the Native Americans up on top of the hill. Yeah. This is the way you're supposed to see bison. Not behind a fence. These pictures are a little dark, but you can still figure out what's going on. Uh, well, Goodnight chose that country for a reason. Because of those canyons, those canyons make really good natural fences. So the western side of our park basically doesn't have any fence at all. It's all natural. That's what That holds them in. Now, on the northern and eastern side, we do, and the southern side, we do have fencing. And, uh, you know, I did a lot of research. I looked when we were doing this thing. I searched and searched and who did what kind of fencing, national parks, you know, state parks. We're not the first one to turn bison out 
for the public. We're the first one in Texas to do it, but there's obviously Wichita Mountains and Yellowstone and a bunch of other places that have done it, Department of Interiors. And I reached out to all these people, and I said, what's your fences like? You know, I went and traveled a lot of them. I, I went to different places and worked bison. You know, I, I immersed myself in the bison. I immersed myself in the bison so much I now have a bison tattoo, you know. <laughs> but anyway, so basically the best fence is whatever fence you have. The best fence is keeping them happy inside the pasture. You know, we purposely did some of our interior fences. They're just four-strand barbed wire fences with no post, nothing but T-posts is all they are. And, you know, I mean, you could drive over it with a car if you wanted to. The bison have broken through that. The only time that happens is when you get two bulls fighting, and there's no fence that's going to keep them in that. Of course, the same can be said to, you know, a big Charley bull, too. You know, when they get to fighting, they can go through any fence. But the key is keeping them happy. When they're in a big pasture, it's easy. The tighter you get them when you work them, it gets tougher. You do have a little, have a little stouter fences. So our working facilities are pretty stout. Oh, this guy cracks me up here. I like him. You probably can't tell, but there's a fake one in there. You see that fake silhouette? So speaking of the, our working facilities, we do work the bison every year, and we probably always will have to work the bison. Even though we consider this a wildlife, this was a, a wildlife reintroduction is what this was. This is not an exhibit. This is not a zoo. We turned them out into the park in a semi-free-ranging area. Okay? So, and, uh, but we will always have to manage them because it's a limited space. So every year we bring them in. We do work them. We do... Uh, health checks on them. We do some uh, vaccinations. We check all of the females to see which ones are pregnant. You know, we do a, a, a basically a cattle workup on them is what it is. And it's, uh, we do it once a year, and it takes about a day and a half, two days to do it. And it's, it's quite fun, let me tell you. They are completely different than working cattle. I promise you that. Yeah, that's, it's a whole different ballgame. How many? Uh, Probably we'll never know for sure anymore since we've turned them out in the park, but uh, we're guessing we're going to be, after calving season this year, we'll be real close to 200. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm going to tell a little bit about the, the park itself. So this blue is a, the historic pens where they were kept. Uh, there's a the line there, 150 over here and 150 over here. This is where they were kept. This is the headquarters area. Phase one was to release them into this restored prairie out here with the lake. So this blue line, the red line, this is all fence that we built. It's either existing fence or new fence that we built. So we went from about 300 acres to about 1,000 acres. That was pretty awesome. That was in 2011. As soon as we finished that, we started working on the next phase. To kind of give you an idea, this is that 1,000 acres. The green is the park boundary. So there's a county road that runs right through here. So there's about 2,500 acres over here that's basically not contiguous to the park because of the county road. So that aside, that, that's not part of the bison range. But in 2014, we worked and we opened the gate right here and let them out into everything else. So now they have about 12,000 acres to roam. No interior fences. Well, we have a few protecting some cultural sites, but basically it's just big one big area. They can go right down the road. They can come right through the campgrounds, walk right by your camper. They can stand at the bathroom door and not let you in. <laughs> you, know. you can, you, these yellow lines are trails. These are all of our trails in the park. We have about 28 miles. And you can see bison anywhere in this park. You can come around a corner on one of these trails and head on with a 2,000 or 1,900 pound bull. So, I mean, it's, it's, it adds a whole different element to your experience, without a doubt. It's pretty awesome. <clears throat> so, we've gone just from a bison restoration to now it's, it's a habitat restoration. So, we've got the bison out in the park, and unless we can find some money to buy more land, we're pretty much stuck with what we've got. So, now our focus has turned into taking that land and make it, you know, pristine, make it as good as we can get it. So, that's what we're doing now. And uh, the mesquite and juniper 
have really taken over that landscape. Over the last couple of centuries, somewhere along the way, we decided that fire was a bad thing, so we stopped the natural process of burning, and it allowed these mesquites and junipers, which are native, they should be there, but they shouldn't be there in the numbers that they are. So it's allowed them to encroach in areas that would have been rolling plains or prairies, and that's where we're at now. So we use fire, but we're so far behind the curve that fire doesn't do it anymore, so we have to use chemical. We can't use mechanical. I'd prefer using mechanical, but the problem with the mechanical is is that that park has over 300 known archaeological sites, and no telling how many more that are unknown. It has more archaeological sites than most other state parks combined. So the ground is very sacred to our cultural resource folks, and it sh- well should be. So we can to do any kind of ground disturbance is is it takes an act of Congress. So we have to find other ways to do things. And that's why we're using chemical and fire and even the chemical that we use. We found a new chemical that came out about five years ago that is not uh, petroleum-based. So it doesn't mess with any kind of carbon dating if, if you uh, get some on arch- uh, artifact or something. So, I mean, we had to be very careful in how we do what we do. So we're working on uh, using fire. We've restored prairie dogs. Everybody happy about that? So there's a lot of folks that don't like prairie dogs. It's hard to believe, right? But if prairie dogs aren't supposed to be in Caprock Canyon State Park, where are they supposed to be, you know? I mean, that's, that's, that's the way I look at it. And I've, I've, I had some neighbors that weren't very happy with me when we started doing this, and I told them, I said, here's my cell phone number. If you see one on your land, shoot it. If you don't want to shoot it, you call me. I'll shoot it. I'll trap it. I'll get rid of it for you. If, if they become a problem, we'll take care of it. And that was, I guess it's been five or six years ago, and I haven't got one call yet. So I think we're doing all right. So we do, uh, we do management hunts. We do a uh, limited number of deer hunts to try and keep the numbers down. Uh, we are working currently to get some pronghorn in the park. Anybody has any spare pronghorn they want to donate to the park, we'll take them. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> so even though they're not native, we do stock the lake with uh, trout in the summertime, or wintertime, I mean, so provide a little wintertime activities too. But we do stock it with native fish as well. So this is really cool, and I don't know if you can see it, but she's wearing a collar. She's got her little piece of jewelry here. That's a GPS tracking collar. That allows us to keep track of where she goes. I have, I think, five of these collars on right now. Four of them are on cows and one of them's on a young bull. Now, the thinking, the logic behind this is even though I've only got four or five of these collars on, they don't travel by themselves at that age, especially the females. So if I see one dot, I'm probably seeing 25 or 30 animals. So it's a good way for me to keep track of where the herd goes over time. So I, I, I printed out our made a little documentation of, of one animal over about a one-month period, and that's what that is right there. So you can see the red dots. Now, the, the weird thing, and it's not weird when you really think about it, but if you look, it, they've got a track that they, they do. It's all the way back here, and they come back around, and they stay on the eastern side of their territory. They don't go over here very often. Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is the landscape. I mean, that's where the canyons are. So, and they, they like open terrain. Uh, so they just don't go over there. But the other is, is it's really, really thick. So you can look right here. There's a lot of dots. And there's a lot of dots right there. And then our, back in here, there's quite a few. Those are the areas, guess what? Those are the areas that we've restored. That's what they like. And that's what these GPS trackers are going to do for us. They're going to let us monitor our, uh, see how good our efforts have been. Okay, so we got a, actually I've got a student out of Tarleton that's doing a research project. She's doing some spatial analysis on where these bison are going, where they're going, and why they're going there. And she's putting everything in there from trails to roads to, you know, what could be causing them to go these directions. And we're going to be able to focus our efforts a little bit more on certain areas and stay away from areas like back in here where they're never going to go. You know, so it just allows us to work on that a little bit better. That's a big factor of it as well. There are, there are some, uh, of course, there's a lake down here. She asked about water, by the way. 
There's a lake here, and there are some springs back in the park that run pretty much year-round. Uh, and currently we do have some artificial watering holes set up. Um, we may always have to have them. I don't know. You know, a uh, hundred years ago there would have been more water in these canyons than there is now. Yeah, yeah, that absolutely. You, you, if we were to move water over here, they would move over here without a doubt. And that's part of the deal. Is and and as we restore this land, as we take the mesquites and junipers out, it very possibly could cause the springs to come back more. Okay, a lot of it is tied to that. A lot of it is tied to the the farming practices as well. So. You know, some of it we can help, some of it we can't. Some of it's just the way it goes. But we'll do what we can and, and provide more water, whether it be drilling a well to, to provide water or what. But, yeah, we're working on that as well. So, again, I said there's 28 miles in the park. But in addition to the park itself, which is about 14,000 acres, we have the trailway. Now, the trailway runs from South Plains up on top of the Cap Rock, all the way down the Cap Rock, through Kittaquay, through Turkey, all the way out to Esteline, 65 miles. That's part of the park as well. It's an old railroad line that has been converted into a multi-use trail. So some places it's 100 foot wide, some places it's a quarter mile wide, but it's a long, narrow alley is what it is. And it runs through three different counties, and uh, I have five different justices of the pieces that I have to deal with. So it's, it's, it's a really, it's a nightmare to, to manage, but it is it's part of the park, and it's pretty awesome, especially down here. We have the Clarity Tunnel. It's uh, the last operating railroad tunnel in the state of Texas. It stopped operating in 1989, and it's about 750 feet long, and it's kind of at a curve. So when you're walking through it, you can't see the other end. You're walking into the darkness. And then about the time you start to get to a point where you're just like, you know, I don't know if I want to go any further, then you start to look around, and, oh, there's the, there's the end. And, and it's home to about half a million free-tailed bats in the summertime. Yeah. That's, that's more than Carlsbad Caverns. That's a lot of bats. Not near as much as in Austin, but it's a lot of bats. We have some grand views, let me tell you. This is a good example of, of what the western side of the park looks like over here. They even have a pretty good winter sometimes, not this year. But it's, you put about five or six inches of snow on that ground, it's gorgeous. And with that, I'm done. So, thank you. I, I assume we've got a few minutes for question and answer, and I'd be more than happy to answer questions. How about you back there first? Okay, she, yeah, she asked about where the bison, the, the bison that you buy in the grocery store, where does it come from? And uh, remember, we had 30 to 60 million bison at one time, and currently there is about 500,000 bison in, in North America, and about um, 450,000 or more of those bison are in commercial production. The rest of them are on national parks and stuff, but, but there is a whole industry, it's the National Bison Association, I'm part of it, that, that raises bison for meat. It's a, it's a much healthier meat. It's better for you. Um, it's not cheap at all. But it tastes pretty good. And uh, actually by consuming bison, you're helping to conserve bison. And I know it sounds weird, but what you're doing is you're promoting the species. Okay? If everybody stopped eating bison, there's 480,000 bison that now no longer are going to exist. Yeah, and, and the bison market is growing, so there's more bison that, that are coming up in that commercial side as well. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I was. Yep. Texas bucket list. Oh, Shane, yeah, that was me. Do you want to? We got a microphone here, so if you raise your hand, I'll bring you the mic. She, by the way, she asked me if I was interviewed by the, it's the Texas bucket list, I think, Shane McAuliffe, the TV show. Actually, we've had... That show out there, we've had uh, Chet Garner, Road, what is this? Day, day, the Day Tripper, the Day Tripper. We've had Texas Country Reporter out there. We had Mike Rowe with, uh, he did Dirtiest Jobs. 
he was he was doing something. Uh, the, the other show was called Somebody's Got to Do It, and it was about relocating prairie dogs. So he came out and relocated prairie dogs with us. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, we've had a little bit of publicity. It was pretty neat. It actually started with Goodnight. Charles Goodnight started that process, and he called them Catalo. But yes, nowadays they call them Buffalo or Beefalo. But it's it's a process that he tried for a good while, and and finally decided it just wasn't worth it because it's too hard to get them to mate, and you know half of them are sterile that come out, and so he gave up on the process. But there is there's actually a National Beefalo Association. So there is, there are people out there that are actively doing that. Now the National Bison Association, it is in our bylaws, and the Texas Bison Association, it's in our bylaws to not do that. Our goal is to promote bison, not beefalo. So, and and I, I can't honestly say I've ever eaten beefalo, so I don't know what it tastes like, but there is some of it still going on. You have a question over here? Yes. One of your pictures showed when they were near the uh, main entrance, a lot of, I'll use a nice word, manure. The, the uh, zoo in Houston sells elephant poo. That's what they call it. Have you all thought about maybe promoting that? I, and how does it differ? Would it be as nutritious to uh, soil as like cattle? Have you ever thought of that? It's absolutely, and, and it's actually, it's considered a natural resource. So it's, it, it's part of the soil. It's returning those nutrients back to the soil. Now, there is an area around the Honey Flat area that occasionally gets so full that we do allow some folks to come in to, to Boy Scouts basically pick it up, and then we'll let you know, some of our local farmers use it if they want to. But it's very minimal. But most of it, we, it's, it's just like the dead trees. Okay, when a tree falls over, it decays. It turns those nutrients back in the soil. It's the same with the manure, too. Yes, right here. Did you bring she asked if I brought any brochures, and the answer, unfortunately, is no. I meant to bring a lot of stuff, and I forgot. But, uh, yeah, you can go online. We have a great Facebook page, uh, uh, Caprock Canyon State Park Facebook page. It's got some really good photographs and some nice information. Matter of fact, I'm going to take a second, and I'm going to plug our festival that we have. September 22nd, this year's festival, it's our annual Bison Fest, and it's a, a fun day. We have arts and crafts vendors, and then uh, it starts at 9 a.m., and then around 3 o'clock, we kick it off on our main stage with country music all day long, and this year's headliners are Wade Bowen and Tracy Bird. So, back here in the back. What is the lifespan? Okay, so... Uh, I guess I did that. They uh, they can live 20 years or so, especially the cows. They can live a long life, and they can be productive that long. You know, with with domestic cattle, you may get five or six calves out of it over its lifetime. With bison, you can get over a dozen, you know, 15 calves out of that one cow. We've got some. I think our oldest cow was born in 1999, and she's still she's still going. Bulls, probably not so much. They don't live as long. What happens, okay, so <clears throat> on the breeding, a little bit of bison history here, or bison 101, they actually have a rut. They're more like deer than they are cattle when it comes to breeding. There is a specific season where they do their breeding. It's not year-round. So all of our calves are born between you know, March and end of April, June. You know, you, you always have some outliers, but... Most of them are born during that time. And what happens is as soon as that cow has given birth, 30 days later she comes back in the season, and that kicks off the rut. So then what happens is, is while, the, while the calving is going on, the big guys are trying to figure out who's going to be the big boy for the year. They do some fighting. They do some arguing. Most of it is done very easy. Sometimes you don't even notice it. But, boy, when they do, you get a couple of evenly matched guys, and they go after it. It is amazing to watch. It's crazy. And they make some deep guttural sounds. And at nighttime, if you're sitting out there camping and you hear those deep guttural sounds of four or five bison bulls, 
you would think that you got a pride of lions around you. It sounds like they're roaring. It's pretty awesome. So they rut. We're at the tail end of the rut right now. They're about done. And then this is the only time of the year that you see the, the, all the animals together. And as soon as the rut's over, the boys will go off and do their own thing. The ones that have gotten kicked out, the ones that are no longer the breeding bulls, they go off to that west side of that park, and they hang out by themselves or with their, one of their buddies, and that's, that's all they do for the rest of their lives. They don't ever come back into the herd. They're retired, exactly. Um, but then the others, the ones that are breeders or up-and-coming breeders, they'll run together in gangs. You'll have a dozen or so of those guys running around. And then what you'll have then are the cows. They'll break off into family groups, basically. So you'll have 20 or, five, 20 or 30 over here, 20 or 30 over here, and they scatter all over the place. That's why it's, it's, it's easy to see bison pretty much anywhere because they scatter. Now, as soon as the breeding season really starts, boom, they all come together in one big herd. And generally they're, they're all together in one place, so you'll either see them or you won't. You know, they get back in the back country, sometimes you don't see them. Yes, sir. That's an ongoing question, to be honest with you. I mean, we've got some numbers in mind, and we're not far away from those numbers. Um, but the more we can restore that park, the better off it'll be and the more it can sustain. So we, whatever we do, we want to make sure. So my job as superintendent is to uh, provide a recreational activity for you guys, but it's also to protect the resources of that park, not just the bison, but everything all the way down to the dung beetle. You know, even the mesquites, unfortunately. But so what we do is is we try and protect everything. So I've got to take a, a holistic approach to this thing, make sure that we're sustainable, make sure that that we're very conservative in our numbers. And so uh, we're working that through, and it's constantly changing with how much we're able to restore. And um, my goal is to have a herd that numbers in the thousands one day. Now, that cannot happen at Caprock. There's just no way. You know. But my goal is to have satellite herds, other state parks. I'm, I'm talking to Native American tribes, maybe having some on some tribal land, you know, federal agencies, whatever, to where we can have satellite herds that are all managed together to really make this a conservation success. That's the goal. Yes, sir. I hear you. Okay. Over here. Do you have a question, somebody? No, I was just wondering. I think you kind of indicated Well, we're actually discussing that as well. And there's no doubt about it. We're going to have to have a, a bison auction of some sorts. I mean, we're just going to have too many. And so we will have to sell some off to, to private industries. Of course, we'll, you know, if... If Yellowstone ever needs some, which they never will, but if Yellowstone or somebody needs some, we'd ship them off to there or wherever. But the problem is, is that everybody's in the same boat. All the conservation herds are in the same boat. They're all at the point where they can't handle anymore, and everybody's trying to figure out how to get rid of them. So there are lots of auctions going on, you know, and, and this hasn't really even been discussed, but I don't see us having any issues down the road of having a few bull hunts in the park, you know, I mean. It's a way to provide another hunting opportunity for the state of Texas. And yes, sir. Yellowstone has been very successful with the elk. Really the price of that has already been Yep. Yeah. Yeah. When is the best time to visit <sighs> January to December. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so our, our season really kicks off at spring break. We get really busy spring break till about July 4th. So we're just coming out of our, our big season. So now it's just too dead gum hot to do much of anything. If you want to drive through the park, that's one thing. But, I mean, we had surface temperatures. We have uh, these gauges that will tell you how hot the floor is. Those canyon floors are reaching 155 degrees. You know, you don't want to be out hiking and that stuff. So uh, summertime is pretty hot, but just to drive through the park is fine. Um, and then about September, when it starts cooling off, we pick up again till about Thanksgiving. And then after Thanksgiving, Jan December, January, February, it's there's nobody there. So it's beautiful all year. I mean, this is probably, of course, with the drought, it's not looking really great. But 
My favorite is the wintertime. You know, I like it cold, but any time is good to come see us. We've had fire all around us, but we've been pretty fortunate, nothing in the park. I do want to say one other thing, though, and I just realized it wasn't in this slideshow. I'm, I guess I took it out. Our visitation, our numbers. So when we first started talking about the bison project and, and turning the bison out, that first year in 2010, we had about 36,000 visitors. And our visitation has done this ever since. We went from 36,000 to like 60,000 to 80,000. And then we were on goal to hit 100,000 uh, two years ago. And we ended up with 900, or 99,978. Didn't quite make it. Last year we busted it. We had 109,000 visitors last year. So our visitation has just gone through the roof. And it's, we're keeping pace with that this year. That's pretty awesome. Yes, ma'am. That's that's a good question. How do you how do you handle your interaction with the animals? And basically, if you're in your vehicle and they're on the side of the road, you can drive right next to them and they don't care. You can be five yards away from them and it's not going to bother them at all. You know, you open up your door and you step out, they will turn and walk away. Hopefully, they will continue to do that. One of these days, they're not, but that's what they're doing now. So the rule is the law. Actually, it is a law. You cannot approach a bison. You cannot get within fifty yards of a bison. Now, the bison don't have to follow that law. So <laughs> if you're sitting down and they come right up to you, you know, and that does happen, I would just suggest you just wait, be still, take some pictures, enjoy it, let them walk on by. Back there. My question is, was he really eating bison? Uh, he happened to be uh, eating a kosher one. So that follows with my next question, which is uh, what percentage of the kosher uh, market is there in, in Texas that stays in Texas? Oh, well, the, co the kosher question, I have no idea. And actually, both questions, I don't know. I mean, m the chances are if he bought buffalo, he's eating bison. Uh, I don't know too many people that sell water buffalo. You know, but that that is something that you have to watch out for when you're buying leather, without a doubt. If you buy buffalo shoes or or buffalo vests or whatever, make sure it is American bison because there is a lot of people that are trying to push off water buffalo, and you may never know, and there may not be much of a difference, but it's just part of it. Yes, sir. Well, the grasses are all there. He asked, what, how, does, how does the restoration work? How, does, how do we do that? So the grasses are there. So we don't have to worry about reseeding. What has happened is that that land was, first they stopped the fire, so it, the brush encroached on it, and it was overgrazed for decades. And uh, then in the 1940s, 50s, when, when it became a park, they took all the cattle off of there. So it hasn't been grazed in several decades now. So what you have are soils that are this hard and bare, okay? Nothing will grow on those soils. So first of all, we've got in the areas where we have a lot of mesquite, we, we spray those. The junipers, we use a chemical, the Velpar, and we do a lot of grinding. After it dies, we grind it, we put it right back into the soils. All the nutrients go back into the soil, plus it provides a mulch. Now the bison come along to these hard soils, and especially if we can get them to congregate in groups, They'll come through there, and they'll beat that soil up. They'll break it up. And, well, they just left an area over here that had grass, and they just ate a bunch of it. They move over here, and what are they going to do? They're going to poop, you know, and they drop that manure right down here, and the next guy comes and steps on it, pushes it into that newly broken up soil, and just planted the seed. So they are nature's farmers, basically. And we just have to give them that opportunity. You know, we just make it easier for them to do that. We've got to get them in the right spaces, and, and at the right time to do those types of things. It's pretty pretty neat stuff. Do the cattle guards work? Um, yeah, not really. 
<laughs> they do for the most part, but, well, we've got them wide enough where they can't jump them now. And, but we're constantly having to do something a little bit different because they're smart. They're a whole lot more smart than domestic cattle. As a matter of fact, I think they know who we are. I think they at least recognize vehicles. I think they might even recognize maybe uniforms. I don't know, but but they know who we are, and 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 if they see us coming, they won't jump that cattle guard. But as soon as we leave, they'll. I've seen them walk it, walk right across it. You know, we've had to pull a couple of calves out of it that didn't make it. You know, but for the most part, they don't. It's just a few. I had one old cow, old number four. I'll never forget her. She's no longer with us, but she figured out that she could. We, we had a regular-sized cattle guard, and then we put another one. Well, in the middle was a concrete space about this big. She figured she could, figured out she could jump to that middle and then jump again. And she would just, wouldn't go anywhere. She'd just go right outside the front where the green grass was and nobody was grazing and eat there and then come back in. You know? <laughs> but we have not had any, one time, one time we had bison going down the road. Okay, most of the time what happens if they get out for one reason or another, which has been very few times, it's it's the whole herd is still in the park so they're not going anywhere they're just staying right there generally it's a calf running up and down the fence that got through a hole or something but one time on the north side of the park and this is was a scary day because i got a call from the sheriff that says i just got a call that there's some bison out on the highway and i go out there and sure enough there's about 50 yards of fence that were was torn down and it turned out it was a couple of bulls that were fighting and they were about a quarter mile down the road, just walking down the highway. You know? But we were able to turn around and bring them back in, no big deal. But, yeah, that's that's the, the scary part. But it, other than that, it's all been pretty good. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was wondering if you could tell me, how how do you find the, the, buff, the bison females in terms of the protectiveness of the calves? And, and the reason I bring that up is we were in Missouri one time at a park up there, a state park. They had a small bison herd. And uh, the, one of the calves uh, got right up next to the fence. And, of course, you know, being cute and cuddly and stuff like that, the, little, the children were up there trying to pet it and reach through the fence. And the female came up, and she wasn't having any of that now. So she reared back and hit that fence where those kids were about three or four times. And they had a pretty substantial chain link fence. But we were quite a ways down, and you, you, could, you could feel that, that vibration. And when she hit that thing, she meant business, and she didn't want anybody messing with her calf and I just wondered if you are they more protected than domestic cows or yes they okay. are very much so when it's calving season you don't you don't go anywhere near them when it's calving season you stay away from them. when it's rut season you stay away from the males you know I mean it, again if you're in a big area it's no big deal but when they come through the campsites and they're used to people they know I mean they, they pretty much have figured out that people are not not their enemy here in the park anyway so it's not been an issue but yes if you were to try and go mess with that calf that mama's going to do something they have a language they actually talk to each other they recognize each other it's pretty awesome i can go up into a herd of bison and there'll be a calf over here and i can i can get kind of in the way of that calf and that calf will make a noise and next thing i know here comes mom or better yet what's what's cool is when you see the mom make a noise and the calf jump up and run over there I mean, they talk to each other. You know, they're very protective. Do you have one more question? How long am I going to work at the park? I guess until they tell me I'm not working there anymore. <laughs> I, uh, we're firmly established in Kittiquay. We're staying there. My wife, we own a building in downtown Kittiquay, which sounds great, right? I mean, it's been downtown Kittiquay. You know, there's not much to it. <clears throat> but we own a building, and my wife has a salon where she does hair. We've got a little rental that we rent upstairs for overnight, and uh, you know we're we're entrenched in the the community now, so we're staying there. <clears throat> Is that it? Well, anybody else have a question? Do you have any questions for Henry? He's over here hiding against the wall. <laughs> yeah. What is the range on that on that shot on that buffalo gun? Um, it varies. It, it varies with the uh, ammunition you use. That particular <laughs> rifle shoots a 40 caliber. In fact, I just happen to have one right here. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a 4090, which means it's a 40 caliber bullet, 90 grains of powder. Uh, among those gun guys, it's a 2 and 5 ace. 
first to the length of the case. Uh, a, lot of it, a lot of it depends on the weight of the bullet, powder charge, you know, in addition to all that kind of stuff. Um, that particular rifle, I can pretty much guarantee that you're going to, a good, good shooter can probably hit something at 600 yards, 800, oh, wow. yard, 800 yards. Buffalo hunters rarely fire at targets further than a couple hundred yards because every bullet spent is money out of the pocket. It's, it's legitimately dumb. You scout out your herd, you, you try to get as close as you can, and you, you, you pop them as you as you, as you, as you were able to. But a uh, lightweight bullet like this shoots flatter than the big 50 that everybody thinks all buffalo hunters use. Not as many buffalo hunters use those as, as you might think. But a lightweight bullet with a large powder charge is going to shoot pretty flat. So uh, you could conceivably hit something with this uh, 800 yards. Generally not going to because it's, it's not feasible. But I have I have fired a mine which shoots, just have to have one, shoots one of these. Uh, that's a heavier bullet. I can hit uh, full-size buffalo silhouettes at 500 yards. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm just hitting it. I'm not necessarily hitting it at the small spot that happens to be where you're really aiming at. Uh, but you can hear it and wait four or five seconds and hear the ding as well as the target. Any other, Any other questions? questions? We'll take, we'll take one, one or two more. more. Uh, yes, I have a question for you, and I know you're involved with this, but where did Buffalo Soldiers get their names from? From Buffalo. Well, I'm just playing. You were also soldiers. soldiers. We've done this before. This is a, this is a, this is bad. No, um, actually, uh, the the when the when the when the soldiers first come out on the frontier after the Civil War, about 1867 or so, the Indians noticed them, and they noticed the resemblance with well, when I had hair, so you see that, and maybe the their beards. Kind of looks like buffalo, and, and as you all know, Indians would take a characteristic and apply a char similar characteristic of an animal and call that person that's a so-and-so person or so-and-so whatever. Buffalo soldier. He's a soldier. Looks like a buffalo. Hence buffalo soldier. There was, a, there was one myth that said it was because of the heavy buffalo coats they wore in the wintertime, which is not true. The Army didn't issue those. Until no. <laughs> so uh, about 1868 or so, we're not sure if it happened in Texas or Kansas. Because uh, 10th Cavalry were in Kansas before we moved down here. Uh, but about 1868 or so, the first time we see it actually in print is about 1872. Okay. Well, I'm sure we all wish that we had Henry's knowledge, Donald's job. It sounds like the absolute most wonderful thing. I think we all can realize now how lucky we are to have Donald take care of our herd. The thought and the effort and the research and the work that goes into maintaining, bringing it to fruition, and then maintaining it. And, Marie, and we have to clean bathrooms. And, and, yeah, and they have to clean bathrooms. Marie, do you have anything you want to say in closing remarks? And let's please give these gentlemen a wonderful round of applause. Thank you so much. Wow, wasn't that interesting? So many things I didn't know. I hope you those of you who are m members of the Friends of the Library, I thank you so much. Your donations make more of a difference than you can know. And those of you who are n not members yet, please consider helping us and helping all of the students of Texas Tech University. Thank you much for coming. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you at the next event. Thank you. <laughs>